Hey, well, we have yet another special day uh, because every day in the Lord is special. But today is special because brother, pastor, intern Alex Harmon is preaching today. And uh, yeah, so praise the Lord for how he's made Alex and how he's, uh, tr the Lord has just done a mighty, mighty work in his life uh, for the past five or six years. It's been awesome. And his family's life, it's been awesome. So, but it's a bittersweet day today because this will actually be Alex's last uh, Sunday official here as a pastor intern. So he's been serving us as a pastor intern for four plus years. We, it's all, it's all, you know, it, it was over COVID. So we all know that no one could keep track of time during that time. <laughs> so, but yeah, so we're going to be, um, always family with him. He has left a, an everlasting impact on our community. Uh, but it was just, the Lord just kind of brought this timing together to where, um, he's preaching today. He was scheduled to preach, and then he takes off, him and his family take off tomorrow to go to Massachusetts to do a six to eight week uh, preaching internship up there. And then when he, what's that? I'll miss yeah, you. so we're going to miss him dearly. Uh, but uh, I, I mentioned that before he preaches just because, um, I don't know, we, we just love you so much, and we're just, I'm just so excited to just hear the Lord speak through you. And so for that reason, I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to pray for you. And then we're going to pray for him afterwards as well to kind of send him on. And there's, I know there's so much more information we could share, but um, let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for my brother Alex. Thank you for his family. Uh, just what you have brought together, let no man separate. Uh, Lord, I pray that you will just continue to protect him. I pray that... Um, that just today, that he'll be present right now. He's here, and you're here, and that he'll just preach your authoritative, awesome word. Um, Lord, we just know that we don't need to add anything onto it, and we certainly aren't going to take anything away from it. Uh, may he just preach your word with freedom, according to how the Spirit uh, prompts him and leads him. Uh, we thank you in advance for it, and may we be um, listeners and doers of your word. We pray these, uh, this all in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, good morning, Crossroads. This is the first sermon I preached with two children, so getting here this morning was a little interesting, uh, but we made it. We're here. Praise God. Uh, so we have been going through the book of James. Last week was Pentecost Sunday, so we took a break, and Kurt preached on Pentecost, but we're going to flip back to James. We're going to pick up where we left off. So we are going to be in James chapter 2. If you have a pew Bible, it's going to be on page 855. So if you want to flip there with me, James chapter 2, and we are going to be reading from verse 14 to verse 26. So I'll give you a second to hop over there. I'm going to have some more texts, uh, but those will be on the screen. But all the, all the texts that are in James, they won't be. So if you have a Bible in front of you, that will be really helpful. All right. So James 2 starting in verse 14. This is God's word. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sisters, a sister is without clothes and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, go, I, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it, does not, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. And then James says, well, show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God. Well, good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham uh, considered righteous for what he did when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him uh, as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by 
what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them out in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Let's pray one more time. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you haven't left us alone, but that you've come to us, that you've done everything for us, that you've taught us, you've given us your spirit to lead us into truth. And God, I pray that he would come. I pray that he would be the teacher, and that he would speak through me, that I would get out of the way, and that you would talk to your people through your word, Lord. And we ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. So when I was 16 years old, I just graduated driver's training, and I was super pumped to get out there on the road, as you can imagine, but I didn't have a car. My mom and I, my brother, we all shared a car. We couldn't afford another one. Uh, so, you know, I, I would have done anything in the world to have my own wheels, right? But at the same time, I knew that, you know, I had to rely on my mom, and that, that, that brought us closer together, so it was okay. But whenever I wanted to go somewhere, I had to ask her for a ride. And I, I didn't like that. You don't want to be seen with your mom, you know, when you're 16. You're trying to just go out and do your own thing, right? So one day, I went to my sister's house, and in the front yard was a shiny 1992 teal Chevy Cavalier. Right? That, that was my thought, exactly, right? And, man, I, I was like, a car. It's at my sister's. Like, I could, this could be me, right? I could be in that. So I asked my sister, what's up with the car? She said, it, well, it doesn't run, but if you can get it out of my yard and into your mom's garage, then you, you can have it. So, as you can imagine, I was super pumped, and I said, okay, let's, let's get this in my mom's garage. And somehow we got it in there where it sat for years. And as time went on, my mom realized, wait a second, this, this, car, doesn't, this car doesn't run. And it's, it's not ever going to run, and in fact, it's total, which means that it would cost more money to repair it than it's worth. So, you see, I could, have, I could say I had a vehicle, but that vehicle was what? It was useless, right? So a vehicle, the definition of a vehicle is to transport something from point A to point B. It's, it's, a, it's a means of transportation. So if the vehicle doesn't do that, well, then it no longer serves the purpose for which it was created, and therefore we could say that it's useless, right? So I could brag to my friends, I got a car, I was the man, I would look real cool until it was time to go somewhere. And then it became crystal clear that I did not have a car because I had to ask my mom to help me. So my car, my vehicle was useless. In the same way, James is saying, to say that you have faith, to claim you got faith, but then it's not used. What's the point? There's no, there's no purpose. If it doesn't work, if it doesn't move, then it's, it's dead. So James is saying if you profess to be a Christian, yet your life doesn't back it up, what's the point? So I've titled my sermon, Getting Faith Right. I like titles because they help me know what I'm doing when I lose my spot, and they help you to listen. So that's why I titled my sermon. So this one's called Getting Faith Right, and I believe that is what James wants us to do. He wants us to understand faith rightly. So there's three things we're going to look at. First, we're going to look at what faith is not. Then we're going to look at what faith is, and then we're going to look at how to have it. We're going to look at some application. So first thing I want us to see is what faith is not. So starting in verse 14, James says, What good is it, brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? So James says there's a kind of faith that merely consists in words. It's just talk. He's saying that professing to be a Christian doesn't make you a Christian. He says, what good is it or what advantage does, it, does someone have who just claims to be this way but doesn't act upon it? And then James gives us an example. 
So verse 15, suppose that a brother or sister is without clothes and lacking in daily food. One of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and be fed, but does nothing about his physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. So James is saying the deciding factor of our faith, the way that we know that we have faith, the way we can tell its authenticity, it's not in what we say, but it's in what we do. And John, actually, this, this theme is throughout the Bible, but in 1 John, we get a couple of really clear texts that say basically the same thing. So 1 John 1, 6 says, if we say we have fellowship with him, we claim to have faith, while we walk in darkness, then we lie, and we do not practice the truth. And then in chapter 2, verse 7, he says, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar and the truth is not in him. Now, right here, there's a tension. I feel the tension when I read this because I go, well, wait a second. I'm messed up. What do you, what do you mean that I keep the commandments perfect? How, how do I do that? So there's a really good distinction that my, my wife actually helped me uh, to see, and there's a distinction between what we would say is true obedience and perfect obedience. So, we would say that true obedience, or so perfect obedience is what Christ did. Perfect obedience is his sinless life. It's him refraining from sin and then doing that which God requires. So there's a, there's a passive and active element to that obedience, and that's perfect. That's what Christ did. We cannot do that. Don't let anybody ever tell you that you can be perfect this side of heaven because it's not going to happen. At the same time, not off the hook, there is what we would call true obedience. And true obedience is having a heart that's after God's own heart. I mean, think about, think about David, right? David murders somebody. Well, first he has an affair. Then he murders somebody to cover it up. And the Bible says that that man, when he repented, displays that he, his heart was after God's own heart, right? So John Owen said that this is, this is an example of, of uh, true obedience. It's to prefer Christ above ourselves and his concerns above our own. True obedience is to have our aim as the will of God over the will of our flesh. And it is to pursue God's desires over your desires and to keep coming back to him and getting up even when you fall. So I think that we need to have that distinction clear. And there's a, sometimes there's a dichotomy that happens that's like, well, I can't keep the law perfect, so I'll just kind of try my best. And we don't really need the Bible. We don't really need to figure out how to obey God. And at the other end, there's, there's legalism. And both of those are wrong, and we can reconcile both of those by what we would say is pure or, or true obedience. So that's the first thing I want us to see. The next thing we can say about faith, that what it's not, is it's not having correct theology. Verse 19, you believe that there is one God. Well, that's good. But even the demons believe that, and they shudder. So James here is referencing the Shema, which is we read in Deuteronomy 6.4, and it's, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And... So Israel is surrounded by all these pagan nations, and God wants them to know, hey, there is one God. I don't care what all these people are doing. I'm the only God. There is no other. And he wants them to know that. So the Shema is kind of a shorthand for your theology. It's kind of a shorthand confession of faith. So when we read that, James is not just making a statement about God. He's saying, you have good theology. You believe what Israel believes. You believe what God has told us to believe in the Old Testament. And that's great. But just to profess that alone does not mean that you have genuine faith. He says even the demons believe that and they shudder. So having sound theology, it, it, in one sense, it doesn't make you any different from the devil. The devil has awesome theology. He's got us beat by a thousand times. So, saying that, we need to realize that that doesn't make us 
a Christian. Now, Jesus says something really stunning in John, John chapter 2. He says, in John chapter 2, verse 23, he says, now when he was at Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. So notice it says they believed in his name, and yet Jesus did not entrust himself to them. So they affirmed some right things about Jesus, right? But that doesn't mean that they were after Jesus, that they, their hearts were after Jesus. So there's this idea that was prevalent in the first century, and it's, it's so prevalent today, and it's the idea that my faith just consists of stuff up here, just consists of ideas in theology. If I believe the right things, then I'm good. I don't need anything. I believe in Jesus. I raised my hand. I said the prayer. I'm good. That's where I'm at. That's the idea. But theology is not an end in of itself, but it's a means to an end. And that end is obedience. That end is worship. That end is love. That end is Jesus himself. Theology is the lens through which we can see the beauty and the glory of God. So Jesus said in John chapter 5, He said, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about Me. Yet you refuse to come to Me that you may have life. So the goal of the Christian life is not theology, it's doxology. It's worship, it's praise, it's fellowship with God. So if your theology doesn't produce that in your life, well, it's either wrong theology or you don't really believe it. Ian Hamilton said, theology that is true theology, it cannot leave you inactive. And to add to that, I'd say that the proof of our faith, it's not in our theology, but in the impact of that theology on our lives. So application. Does that sound like what you think this morning? Does your Christianity exist up here alone? Or is it lived out in your life? Is it just a collection of theological points and beliefs and ideas? Or is it in what you do? Does your confessional theology, that's what I confess, I'm confessing this, I I believe this, I believe that, does my confessional theology match my practical theology? Does it match my practice? Do those things come together? If someone were to follow you or me around all day and we couldn't say a single word, what would they think? You couldn't open your mouth and tell them that you believe in Jesus and you didn't have your you know, Jesus t-shirt on, what would, what would they say? Would they say, this person's living in a different way? What's, something's different about you. I don't know what it is. And we don't need our mouths to do that. So now the plot is going to thicken a little bit. Because I hope as we read the, the, the text in the beginning, there's a verse that really stands out and it really scares the daylights out of me. And it's verse 24. But I'm going, to read verse, I'm going to read verse 21 to 24. Uh, James says, Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture says, or was fulfilled, that says Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. Oh man, it's like the, the record just, whoop, it just stops. What are you talking about, James? So it appears on the surface as if James is contradicting Paul, or he's contradicting what we read in the rest of the Bible. And I've heard this, I've heard people say that they're not Christians because of this exact uh, discrepancy right here. So just stick with me for a second, just going to like, yeah, it might be a, a, a challenge just for a minute, but it's so important we have, to, we have to talk about it. So we know that Paul says we are saved, we're justified 
by faith alone. In Romans 3.28, Paul says, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So the way that we solve this is actually in what James says back in verse 18. He says, But someone will say, You have faith, and I have deeds. So show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. So in other words, faith and actions, they can't be separated. Actions demonstrate beliefs. So faith and actions are really just two sides to the same coin. You can know what someone says, but you you don't really know what they believe until you watch them live. So Paul is saying that we cannot be saved by keeping the law. Amen. Hallelujah. We can't do it. We can't get to heaven by our deeds. And nevertheless, if we have salvation, it will be demonstrated by our deeds. So one theologian says this, we are not saved by faith alone, but by faith, but the faith that saves is never alone. So Paul's saying that we're not saved by our actions, but by a faith which produces action. And these are the actions which James is is referring to. So we might say that Paul is telling us what faith is, and James is telling us what faith does. Right? So Paul gives us 11 chapters in Romans. He just, bam, bam, he's just going through it. He's just telling us theology, he's telling us what faith is. He's going through all that. James is saying, hey, this is what that looks like in your life. Okay? So both of these come together perfectly. They're not contradictions. They're the same thought. It's tapped into the same vein. So then a question comes up is, well, then how does faith save us? Because that seems like we're meriting something. Well, faith believes what God has said. That's what it does. It believes that I'm a sinner, and because of my sin, I, I cannot obtain heaven. I cannot obtain righteousness that I'm broken, that I'm dead in my trespasses and sins. There's nothing I can do on my own to get out of that. And God comes and he helps us. So this is what Romans, uh, Romans 3 says. But the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there's no distinction For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation or a a substitute by His blood to be received by faith. That was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that He could be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So Paul is saying, there's one who died in my place, and his name is Jesus Christ. And he took the wrath of God on himself so that I could be forgiven, so that you could be forgiven. He paid your penalty in full so that we can be reconciled to God. So moving on now to what faith is, faith is what holds on to that reality. Right? So Jesus, what he did on the cross, he did that for me. Totally, absolutely on his own. Faith apprehends that, right? Faith is, we could say, it's not the object. Jesus is the object. Faith is just the instrument that holds on to him. And really, he's the one holding on to you, right? So the awesome thing about that is that when we are connected to the vine, when we are uh, connected to Christ, He changes us, right? He's the one who does it. The best example of this is Ezekiel 36. Now, God's talking about the new covenant. He's talking about what He's going to do to His people. And this is what He says, I, me, I, God, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and I will cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful. 
to obey my rules. So that's what God does to people who have faith in Him. It's God's work. We apprehend it. We hold on to it by faith. So there's a distinction that I think is really helpful. It's helped me for a long time. And it's called uh, the, the fruit and the root distinction. I know I'm throwing a lot of stuff out here, but this text is just like, there's just so much. And if we get it wrong, we're going to be confused. So that's why some of these things are important. So it's called the fruit and root distinction. So picture with me a tree, right? You have, um, you have a, a, a root. There's the roots of the tree, okay? Now, when Paul is talking about being saved by faith, he's talking about those roots. He's talking about the foundation of our justification, which is Jesus Christ on the cross, right? That's what Paul's talking about, okay? But what James is talking about He's talking about the fruit that comes from that tree in our lives when we're connected to Jesus Christ. So, fruit and root. Christ is the root. He produces the fruit, right? This is exactly what Jesus says. He says that uh, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Bad tree can't produce good fruit. So we might say in one sense that the actions or their deeds, they justified them because the only way that they could do these deeds is if they were connected to Christ. So so check check this out. So the commands of God are impossible. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Count others more significant than yourself. Yeah, right. That's impossible. Count others more significant than myself? There is no way I can do that on my own. It's impossible. So if I do those things, it proves, it demonstrates that I'm connected to a supernatural God. So there's things in our lives that God calls us to do that on the surface, they are impossible. But then when he empowers us to do them, the world will look and say, wow, how in the world were you able to forgive that person after what they did to you? How in the world are you able to just talk about this this Christ that you can't see? How in the world do I love people more than myself? The world has, has nothing, knows nothing about that. But when we do that, it demonstrates that it's not us but that we're connected to a supernatural God. And that's exactly what James is is telling us. Now, that's that's what he says when he refers to Abraham. He gives us a couple great examples here. So, he references Abraham, but I'm going to read it from the book of Hebrews because there's more detail, but it's the same thing. So, Hebrews 11, 17 through 19. Oh, I don't have my Bible in front of me. So, by faith, Abraham... When he was tested, he offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. So what is faith? Faith is the assurance of what God has said. It's a confidence in God's abilities. Notice he says um, that he considered that God was able. So faith is a considering that God is able to do something for us. And when we believe that, it's manifested in our lives. So think about this. Put yourself in Abraham's shoes for a second. I mean, before this, God tells Abraham to to get up and to, to go to a place that I will show you. Just, just get up and just start walking. And then a few verses later, he says, now I want you to offer up your son Isaac on the altar. And Abraham does it. So think about this. Like, hold on. First you're telling me to just pack up all my stuff, and now you're telling me to sacrifice my son, whom you promised me I would have, and I've waited like a hundred years for, Now you're telling me to to put him on the altar and sacrifice him? That's crazy. 
Who does that? It makes absolutely no sense at all, unless, of course, God raises the dead. Well, then it makes a lot of sense. All of a sudden, it makes perfect sense. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them out in a different direction. Well, that makes no sense at all. You're going to risk your neck for these strangers that you you just met, you don't even know them. You're just going to invite them into your house and then you're going to send them away and you're going to essentially kind of tell a little fib so that they don't get caught. And you're going to risk your life doing that. That doesn't make any sense unless she believed that Jericho is going to fall to the ground in a couple weeks, and she believed that God was going to be the one who did that. So you see, they did things that were only possible because they believed in God. So what is faith? Faith is taking God's Word to the bank. It's, it's letting God's Word dictate our whole life because we believe that it's true. That's what faith is. It's a confidence in God. It's an assurance that what He has said is true, so much so that even when we don't see it, we live in the reality of it. So the application this morning for all of us, we need to ask ourselves, is that the faith that we have this morning? So James, I didn't want to preach this, this passage. I didn't. It's my last sermon. I wanted to be all nice. I wanted to be super duper happy and encouraging. And I tried. And as I prepared the message, I told Danielle, I don't know. I, my outline is not working. And I realized it's because I was trying to fluff it up. I was trying to make it all pretty and happy. And that's not what James is doing. James is telling us how it is. And he wants us to know if we are in the faith. He wants us to examine ourselves so that we can have confidence for the day of the Lord, which is the, the, the most amazing blessing any of us could ever have, right? Imagine if no one told you about Jesus. He just shows up one day. We've been told. We have the good news. We know this. So let's make every effort to make our calling and election sure. Let's do everything we can to put God in front of us and make sure that we know Him, that He's our God, that we, that we love Him, we adore Him. You just took my, my whole sermon, Greg. That's, I was literally going to say that six times, and then I was going to walk off the stage. But no, amen. Um, <laughs> so, amen. There, there's, I, have, I have a surprise for you in a minute. So, um, If we believe in this book, everything will change. Everything will change. Everything about you will change. Everything that you think will change. Your relationships will change. Your desires will change. Your family will change. Now I want us to see kind of something obscure here. Faith has a a purpose, which I think we forget. Sometimes we start talking about faith and am I doing it right? Am I doing it wrong? When we start to forget what faith is, we kind of miss the point. We forget the goodness of walking in faith. We start to think about our deeds as like a resume rather than what we're created to do. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10, says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not your own doing. It's the gift of God. Not a result of works, lest any man boast. Amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Saved by grace alone. Sweet. Very next verse. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we're not saved by good works, but we are saved for good works. You were created for good works. You were created to do the will of God, to live out this book. That's why we exist. I don't know what happened, 
but at least in my life, I was raised to think these commandments of God were like these shackles, or like it was just, like I'm carrying around a, a backpack full of weights, and I thought, this is not fun. I remember having a discussion with my brother one night, and he said, bro, Christianity is just rules, and that's how, that's how I thought my whole life, and then after God changed my heart, I realized, wait a second, this is what I was made for. I was made to live in closeness with Christ and to live that out into the world, to be his hands and feet. Faith is not some meal ticket to get you out of hell. It's not some uh, get out of hell free card. It's not, it's not a flu shot. Like, cool, I got it. Now I'm good. Now I go do my thing. No, faith is the gift so that you might live all of life to God. So I think when we see that, we begin to live that way, and in doing that, we both glorify God and we fulfill the purpose for which we exist. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So in other words, you were created to preserve things, to give flavor and substance in the fragrance of Christ to everywhere that you go, to everyone that you talk to. That's why we exist. So then, if we, if we don't live that way, it's not like, oh, you did, the, you did the bad thing, you're not good enough. No. You're not living your purpose. That's what you're designed to do. Jesus said, you are the light of the world, and a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. What does light do? It shines. That's its purpose. That's, that is, it's the exact same. We are intended to be God's people and to demonstrate that in the world. And in that, as Greg said, we will find true happiness. I think the biggest lie in the entire world was told in Genesis 3 when Satan essentially says, you know, true happiness, that's not found in God's commands. True happiness is found in you doing what you want. You know, God's just trying to put you in a box over there. There's no happiness in that. And nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, it's the exact opposite. If you want to be happy, throw ourselves onto God. Throw ourselves into the things of God. Let's read some of these verses. Psalm 119, 93. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Blessed, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked or stands in the way of sinners or sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. And he will be like a tree that's planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf doesn't wither, in all that he does, he prospers. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. No good thing, no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. My favorite one, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. I want to be satisfied. I like satisfaction. I like joy. I like pleasure, I like happiness. And the lie is that you can't be a Christian and be happy. You can't be a Christian and experience pleasure and joy. You need to be cold and rigid and just, just do the thing. Exact opposite. Think about the most godly people you know. They are the happiest fools on the planet. Well, why is that? Because they're living their purpose for God. And in that, there is endless joy. What might change our lives if we would realize that endless joy is found in this book? Okay, so we talked about what faith is, talked about what it's not. Now we're going to talk application, and then we will, we will close. So, <clears throat> right here, there's a little bit of a, of a difficulty. Um, when I was preparing this, I got to the end and I started saying, okay, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. And then I realized, wait a second, 
James is talking about salvation. James is talking about faith. Okay, so verse 14, what, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but does not have deeds? Can such faith save him? So he's talking about salvation. So the temptation here, after we read James and we're like, okay, let's do it, is to think that we should just start doing religious stuff. Right? I just need to do a bunch of good deeds. But if you notice in this passage, James doesn't give one command. He doesn't give a single command. He is telling us what's true. So as we read the Bible, there's, there's commands, and then there are descriptions. We call it the um, imperative and indicative, which doesn't matter, but there's things that we are being called to do, and there's things that are being talked about, okay? James is telling you what's true. He's saying, if, this is the, if you have faith, this is what it looks like, right? He's not saying, hey, go do religious deeds so that you can have faith. So why does that matter? It matters because if we don't know Jesus, if we're not connected to the vine, right? We're not, if we haven't apprehended him through faith, if we, if we don't have the saving relationship with him, then to try to do good works to obtain that is just legalism. It's just man-made religion. It's just like every other religion in the world. So simply doing good deeds, it's not going to give us spiritual life, right? It's just behavior modification. It's just, it's just bondage. So the root of the problem is not our actions, but it's our heart. So, to use my, my wife as an example, because she loves when I do that. Um, <laughs> so, if I tell Danielle I love her, man, I love you so much. I really do. Like, aside from the sermon, I love you. Um, if I tell Danielle I love her, I love you so much, and yet I spend no time with her, I never think about her, never talk about her, never do the things that make her happy, never make sacrifices for her, then there's something deeply wrong with that, right? My, my actions or my lack of actions, they just prove that I have no love for her, that I have no relationship with her. So then the solution is not do more stuff for Danielle. No, the solution is fall in love with Danielle and the actions follow, right? It's not an action problem, it's a heart problem. So my actions merely express the condition of my heart. Jesus draws this out beautifully in Matthew 15, verse 8 and 9. He says, There is a people that honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. So Jesus isn't saying that vain worship is the problem. Or we might say that it's not the cause of the problem. It's the effect of the problem. The problem is a heart that is far from Jesus. So in other words, a lack of our deeds is not the problem. They are the evidence that our hearts are far from Christ. So if your faith is dead, doing good deeds is not going to fix it. So what is the remedy? And this is why I struggled with this this week. Because the remedy is that we must be born again. We must be born of God. We must fall in love with Christ if these things are to happen in our lives. Jesus said, unless someone is born again, he cannot even see the kingdom of God. And being born means that God gives you spiritual life. Re remember Ezekiel 36. We can throw that back on the screen. Ezekiel 36. I will give you a new heart. I will do it. And I will give you a new spirit. And I will remove the heart of stone from you and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So the solution is that I need a new heart which longs for God. And that is the fruit that James is telling us about. But the new birth, is, it is mysterious. The more I, I study it and the more I get to know people, it is, it's difficult to discern. But what happens is God makes people aware of their sin. He uses sermons or 
His word to awaken us that our, to our sin uh, and, and that our faith is dead, that we're bankrupt before God, that we're sinners, that we, uh, we are in need of a Savior. And in that, He awakens us. He helps us to see that we need Christ and that we can't do it on our own. And we realize that because we can't keep the law, all of a sudden Jesus looks very appealing because He's the only one who did it. And He offers you salvation. He offers you forgiveness of sin if you would apprehend Him, if you'd hold on to what He's done in faith. 1 John 4.10 says, And this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. So if you believe that this morning, here's what you need to do. If you, if you are honest with yourself and you say, man, my faith is dead. I'm not sure what to do. kind of nervous. What do I do? This is what Jesus says to you today. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We come by His call. He gives the rest. And then you throw yourself on His mercy and you say, I'm a sinful person, Lord. Have mercy on me. Forgive me. And He will forgive you. So that's what we all need to do if, if, you have not, if that has not happened to you, then today is the day. But if that has happened to you, Regardless of where you're at, the, the application step is the same thing. Whether you've been a Christian for five seconds or 50 years, or if today is the day, application is the exact same, and that is to pursue Christ. So that's the application for us this morning. Put Christ in front of you. Think about Him. Meditate upon Him. Sing to Him. Write to Him. Talk to Him. Share Him. Believe in Him. And most importantly, hear from Him in His Word. Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. A couple more texts and then we will, we will be finished. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, and we, and we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And in the Bible, in His Word, that is where we behold His glory. We can't go off in the forest and behold His glory. We can go off in the forest and, and worship and use the creation to stir us up and to help us love God more. But we can't know Him from any other means by from His Word. So Christian, fill your minds with thoughts of heaven, of being with Christ, of, of seeing Him face to face, and enjoying Him forever. Think about the day, think about the moment you, you see Jesus in person. Like that's really going to happen. And it's probably not too far away. Like you're going to see His, you're gonna see his face. And it's going to be the most awesome thing in the world. Hopefully. We need to make Him our prized possession. And if we do that, everything will make sense. So this is my, my last word, and this is a quote from a man named Richard Baxter, and I just love this quote. It just makes me so happy. The love of the end is the spring that sets every wheel of our lives in motion. It is the heavenly Christian that is the lively Christian. It is strangeness to heaven, or thinking about heaven, that makes us so dull. So dull. We run so slowly because we so little mind the prize which is Christ. It is the love of the end that quickens all the means, and the more frequently we behold it, the more vigorous and lovely all our emotions will be. The love of the end is the spring that sets every wheel of our lives in motion. So, church, here is my final word to you. Pursue Christ. Set Him always before you. And because he's at your right hand, you won't be shaken. Therefore, let your hearts be glad. Let your whole being rejoice. For Christ will not abandon your soul. He won't let you see corruption. He'll make, you known, he'll make known to you the paths of life. 
In his presence there is fullness of joy, and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have not left us alone. Lord, we thank you that even today, while we are yet sinners, your offer of forgiveness stands, and that you call us all to you right now. And God, I pray if there's anyone who does not know you, somehow through your spirit, Lord, you would awaken their soul to life. Help them to see there's no other way. Life is only in you. Help them to be honest and surrender to you. May that happen right now, God. And Lord, I pray for the rest of us, Lord, that we would stay humble. Help us to see that faith is a gift. Everything that we have is a gift, and why would we boast as if we didn't receive it? Help us to see that as we received Christ, so we would walk in him with humility, always looking up, always being aware of our our sin, of our inadequacies. But in that, even in our sin, Lord, we would see a perfect Savior. And even in our sin, it would stir us up to love you, to be excited by you, to see that what a God we have, that while we were yet sinners, you'd come and die for us. Lord, help us to be overwhelmed by the love of the cross, overwhelmed by what you've done for us, overwhelmed by heaven, which we will soon be. Lord, I pray that today is the day of salvation, and I pray that you would guide us by your Spirit, Lord. We ask you all these things in Jesus' name.